You're listening to the Belly Dance Geek Clubhouse at bellydancegeek.com. Hello, everybody. This is Nadira Jamal, the Belly Dance Geek, and welcome to episode 59 of the Belly Dance Geek Clubhouse. If you have a product, service, or event you'd like to promote, you can become a Clubhouse sponsor. That helps us cover the costs of producing the show, and it lets you reach over 1,500 geeky belly dancers. And if you're interested, you can check out the details at bellydancegeek.com slash sponsor. The Clubhouse is a place where dancers can get together and geek out on all of those things that are hard to get in classes and on DVDs. If you want help with the what, things like moves, combos, choreographies, there are a lot of resources available. But if you want help with the why and the how, composition, business, ethics, musicality, culture, all of that stuff is a little bit harder to find. So every month I interview a different guest expert on a different geeky topic, and we always have time for questions and answers so you can geek out too. So if you think knowledge and creativity go together like chocolate and peanut butter, you are in the right place. My yeah. guest tonight is Morocco, with over 57 years researching, assimilating, performing, lecturing, teaching classes and master seminars internationally in near Middle Eastern and North African dance, which she learned in culture here and over there. Morocco has received numerous awards and accolades in her field, and an interview with Morocco was commissioned by the Lincoln Dance Center Collection's Oral History Archives. Nominated as one of America's 100 Dance Treasures, her reference book, which is now in its fifth printing, You Ask Aunt Rocky, is available in German, Mandarin, soon in Spanish, and her second book, The Fundamental Movement Vocabulary of Rock's Sharky, Oriental Dance, is in English and Mandarin. Morocco organized, and for more than 32 years directed and choreographed, for her dance company, Morocco and the Kasbah Dance Experience, which had its official debut at the Lincoln Center's Out of Doors Festival in 1978. <clears throat> she performed and lectured regularly in New York City's Museum of Natural History from 1970 to 1998. Her articles have been published internationally since 1965. She's been both a presenter and subject of other people's papers at CORD, the ICHPER-SD UNESCO CID, and SDHS conferences. She filmed and produced six research videos or DVDs that won the Giza Award. And she's currently working on the follow-up to You Ask Aunt Rocky and continues to teach and lecture internationally. You can check out her website at kasbadance.org. Welcome, Rocky. Thank you. And as we were saying before the call, happy birthday tomorrow. Thank you. I, it really <laughs> snuck up on me. It seems like 1964 was only about 15 minutes ago. The older <laughs> you get, the faster it goes. And right now it's swirling down the toilet. <laughs> Well, we're so happy to have you back. I'm so thrilled. everybody, uh, Morocco is going to be talking about the changes that she's seen in Oriental dance and the dance world during her career. So we're going to be hitting on her personal perspective over her 57-year career in New York City and internationally. So it may be a little bit different from the experience of folks who are outside the U.S. or in places with smaller Oriental dance markets. Uh, but given the length of her career and all of the teaching and studying that she's done in so many parts of the world, I think this is a really fascinating perspective. So I always like to start with my guest's origin story. So Morocco, can you tell us how you got started in Oriental dance? <laughs> <clears throat> what happened was I was working with the Ballet Espanol Jimenez Vargas. I was a flamenco dancer. And when we were rehearsing, there was no pay because union rules weren't as uh, friendly then. And we were rehearsing, and I was getting skinnier and skinnier because you can't get much to eat on no money. And the studio we rehearsed in was owned by a Greek Orthodox priest who was a friend of mine and a friend of the family's. And he saw me getting skinny and knew that if I died of starvation, my father would probably kill him. So he said he had a friend who was opening a new restaurant and they needed dancers. I could go and audition. So I went with my guitarist thinking they wanted a flamenco dancer because that was what I did. And I get there and the woman who owns the place, her name was Mariantha Stevens. She was half Lebanese and half Greek. Looks at me and says, who this man, your husband? I said, hell no. He's my guitarist. We have a guitar. So in, in terms of flamenco, I was thinking, well, does he know all the rhythms? Does he know how to play for dancers? If I change compas or rhythm, will he change with me? Yes, yes, yes. So I told my guitarist, well, 
sorry, Diego, it looks like they have a guitarist. And he said, that was cool. I didn't want to work anyway. And off he went. So she says, okay, put on uniform and show me what you do. So I go downstairs and I put on the dress with the long ruffle train they call the bata de cola. And I come upstairs and she says to me, what's this? And I'm looking around and I see that there's no actual stage. There's tables to one side and a bare floor to the other side. And I'm thinking, well, maybe they don't want the bata de cola because when you kick it around, dust can get in people's food. So I said, okay, I have the dress with the ruffles and the polka dots and I have the riding suit. I could wear either one of those. And she said, honey, we don't want Spanish dancer. We want ballet dancer. And I said, oh, I don't do ballet, but I do do Escuela Bolera, which is Spanish ballet. No, 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 honey, we want Oriental dancer. What's that? Here, sit, you watch. Then let's see what you can do, because there were a bunch of people there who were auditioning. And this woman gets on, and she looked like Richard Nixon, five o'clock shadow and all, and she was built like a Christmas tree, poor puppy. But the thing that struck me the most was even though I wasn't familiar with the music, I could at least hear there was a rhythm to it. And she couldn't hold a rhythm if you put it in a paper bag and handed it to her. So I'm watching, I'm watching, and finally she finishes, and Marianta comes to me and says, you think you can do that? And I said, if I can't do that, I'll hand in my feet. And somebody else who was there to audition said, oh, yeah, Miss Big Mouth? I'll lend you a costume. Let's see what you can do. Now, a aforementioned person who volunteered her costume was about five times my size to begin with, and without falsies and an ironclad bra, I looked like a 14-year-old boy from the waist up back then because this was 1960. I was like 58 years younger then. Ouch. And about 58 pounds lighter. So I borrow her costume. I had to use all my socks and two rolls of toilet paper to fill the credibility gap in the bra. And I had the belt on backwards because I figured I'd rather cover the front than the back because I didn't want to flash anybody. But at least I could hold a rhythm. And Mariantha says to me, okay, you a dancer. You not oriental dancer, but you dancer. You look good. And I'm thinking, okay, let's hear it for toilet paper. I give you a job two weeks. You look, you learn, you stay. You look, you no learn, thank you very much, goodbye. And that was how I got my first job. Because in 1960, in the three-block radius, actually three and a half blocks, on 8th Avenue in Manhattan, from between 29th and 30th Street to 26th Street, there were 13 Greek and Turkish, and there was going to be this one Arabic restaurant called the Arabian Nights. That was what the club was going to be called. Right across the street on 29th and 8th, second floor in a residential building, was the Egyptian Gardens. There was the Grecian Palace. There was Kafisia, Port Said, Britannia, Alibaba, and a couple of other places where they had three dancers who worked six nights a week, And one dancer who worked three nights, which was the night off for each of the other dancers. So they were employing over 50, 60 dancers a night there. And that was at a time in New York when if there were 10 or 12 people who could call themselves Oriental dancers, that was a lot. Um, So they would have hired Godzilla if Godzilla had a costume. (laughs) I got the job. I flipped for the music. It was the first time I'd heard that music, and as deeply as flamenco spoke to me, this music reached me on an even deeper level. And I also loved the fact that most of the customers in this particular restaurant were whole families that came in, from the great-grandparents down to occasionally a little baby in a basket. And there was a one time when the family left after the club closed, And then they had to come right back a few minutes later because they realized that somebody left the baby in the basket under the table. (laughs) They had to come back and get their baby. But what I'd never seen before that I loved was these whole families were dancing together. The women were dancing with women. The men were dancing with men. The kids were dancing together. I'd never seen two guys dance together. And I'd never seen a guy get up and dance just solo for fun. 
and the music, the singing, they were singing in Arabic, in Greek, in Turkish, and the musicians played all night. And these were people who had regular day jobs, and then they came to play music. This was at a point in the culture when these people loved and wanted their music and their dances. It was much different than it, than it is today, unfortunately, for now. But it was just... It was. It wasn't. It. It wasn't a party. It was a warm, loving atmosphere that pulled you in, and gave you virtual hugs, just for being there. And these were all immigrants, because that area, that area in, in Manhattan, was also the home for the fur manufacturing business at the time. And uh, a lot of the people who worked in the fur industry were Greek because the Fur Workers Union sponsored a high school in a town in Greece to produce students who learned how to work the fur and how to work with it, and then they would bring them over and hire them. And there were a lot of Lebanese, Syrians, Jordanians who came over, and they wanted their food, they wanted their music. These were people who, in their own hometowns, never would have gone to a restaurant or a nightclub. They made their own music in their own homes for special occasions like weddings or uh, births or anniversaries and moulids and holidays. But here, they were isolated. They weren't hearing their music. They weren't doing their dances. So they sought out the restaurants that catered to them. And it was a family atmosphere. Occasionally, of course, you'd get tables of, like, you know, just guys, and some of whom were, they were almost entirely of some kind of near or Middle Eastern origin. Although at that point, the Arabic speakers were mostly Levantine um, from Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and uh, Palestine. And it was only later that Egyptians started coming in that was quite a bit later, although in this particular club, the Arabian Nights, the canoon player, Mohammed al had just come over from Cairo, where he had spent most of his adult life up till then, playing for Umm Kulthum, as had his father. And this was music I heard from 9.30 in the evening till 4 in the morning, six nights a week. And when I had a day off, I'd go to one of the other clubs so I could hear their music, because each club had a preponderance of either Greek or Turkish or Armenian, and there was one that had some Albanian musicians. And this was the one place where they had Arabic musicians on the 8th Avenue venues. And at that time also, I had never heard of this dance. I had never seen it. I didn't know the misnomer belly dance. I didn't find that out until a couple of weeks later when I was telling people in the Fulmenko company where I was working to make money for food while we were rehearsing. And somebody said, do you mean belly dancing? And I said, no, what's that? Well, it turns out evidently that's what I was meaning, according to that person. And they said, how could you? Don't you know that that's that's not a proper dance form? I said, they were not quite that polite. I said, what do you mean that's not a proper dance form? And I got all huffy-puffy because what I saw were the people who loved it and who did it with love and with the people they loved. And then when I was trying twice a night, I had to put on a costume, which the owner had paid to have made for me by an Armenian woman who lived on 28th Street and Lexington Avenue. Because the costumes then were a lot simpler and somewhat skimpier than what we wear nowadays, although they were, they were coins and they were beads and a lot of fabric if you could get it. Um, When I was on stage or on the floor, as it were, attempting to do my two shows a night, they gave me encouragement. And in between sets, you had to put on your party dress and sit on the stage with the band and either play your finger cymbals or play the drum or bang a tambourine. Or some of the dancers just sat there and smoked themselves into an early death or drank enough coffee to keep the whole country going. Um, And you got to watch the people doing their dances. Now, at that point, there were very strict cabaret laws in New York City where if you were female and you worked in any place that had a liquor license and sold alcohol, 
unless you were a cigarette girl, a coat check, a waitress, you could not sit or talk with the customers because there had been a big scandal with um, women in the jazz clubs being forced to shill drinks or go with customers. So they came up with these kind of draconian laws, which was really actually great protection for the dancers because it meant that nobody could force them to sit with people they didn't know and drink or talk with people they didn't know and might not necessarily want to talk to. So you were protected, but you were also up on stage with the band playing, and you got to watch the people dancing if that was what you wanted to do. And that was what I wanted to do. But since I couldn't talk to them, if I saw a woman do a move that I liked, that I wanted to know what was going on, I'd wait till she had to go to the ladies' room, and I'd follow her to the ladies' room because there were like three stalls. And I could talk to her in the ladies' room and say, I like what you were doing up there. Could you show it to me? And a lot of these families, they had the dilemma that their children wanted to become Americans. They didn't want to know from the old country. They were coming with the family because the family said, you come with us or you don't go anywhere. And they were kind of reluctant, whereas here I am, somebody who looked like them, who seemed to like their music, which I did, who wanted to know what they had to tell was thrilled that I wanted to learn. So they took me home to their kitchens and their living rooms, and they showed me how they danced and what they did. And I learned it. I assimilated it the same way they learned it, by dancing with the family. And because I looked like them and because I pretty much kept the proprieties that went with the culture, because I checked that out, they respected me. But because I wasn't actually blood in the family, I also became, in a way, an honorary male in that I could talk to the fathers and the uncles and the male cousins and learn stuff from them without my reputation being ruined by it. So I was in an amazing, ideal situation to be at the best school in the world for this because there were no courses then. They didn't exist. And when I got into the business, there were two types of venues. There were the ethnic venues, which was where I was, thank heavens, and there were the non-ethnic venues, which were like the equivalent of uh, strip clubs in some places where they were legal. They weren't legal in New York City. But there were American venues that would hire, quote-unquote, belly dancers for, like, say, a Friday, Saturday, to mainly put on what they thought was a Dream of Genie costume and go bump a bump a bumping around the dance floor and then do a Sultan act. And that actually paid better than the authentic venues, but you didn't have the music, you didn't have the atmosphere. And I didn't, A, I didn't know they existed. And then when I found out they existed and went to check a couple of them out, there were places that I would not have wanted to work, so I didn't. However, there were no venues in schools, in museums, in concert halls. 98% of the places I work recently were places that were closed to Middle Eastern dance in the 60s, 70s because of the misnomer and the fantasy misinterpretation of that misnomer, which could be very frustrating because when I was in the club, in the restaurants with the people, it was a wonderful time. We were happy. We were having a good time. We were celebrating life. We were celebrating the music. We were celebrating us. And when I was out of that atmosphere, if somebody had the wrong idea of what I was doing, I had a lot of hassles. I can't tell you how often if I was calling and applying for to perform in a venue where the people would say, is that ballet dancing? And then slam the phone down in my ear. Fortunately, in most places that has now changed, but this is 58 years ago. Now, the styles of dance. We weren't that much into styles. It was, can you get up there and dance 30 to 45 minutes a set? And can you follow the rhythms? And will the musicians play something you feel like dancing to? Will they be cooperative? But it was mostly Turkish and Levantine because there were uh, some Lebanese and Syrian uh, girls who were dancing and there were some Turkish girls 
who weren't dancers in Turkey, but they got to America and found out they could make relatively good money doing the dances that they did at their parties at home. So some of them got into the business, and some of them turned out to be really fine dancers. Some of them weren't. Being born there didn't mean that you automatically knew what you were doing. I mean, I was born in Transylvania. It doesn't mean I go around at midnight biting people on the neck and drinking blood. (laughs) I mean, if I bite someone on the neck, it isn't to get to the blood, (laughs) but be that as it may. So we danced the way everybody else in the club did, and it depended on who was working. And you got to watch the different dancers, and you got to see what worked and what didn't work and how the audience reacted because there was a really different reaction to the dancers who were out there having a good time and wanting the audience to have a good time and the dancers who were out there being what they thought was a sex pop. And the atmosphere palpably changed when that type of dancer went on. But as the owners of the clubs would say, you have a varied clientele, you've got to have somebody for the various parts of the varied clientele. So there were a lot of different people that came through. And at that point, there was the way most of the people got paid was they got a low base salary. And then there were there was money thrown at them, at the singers, the musicians, the dancers, while they were performing, partially because the coaches back then threw the money, they showered it, and partially because of the cabaret laws. Nobody could touch you. They had it showered, and at the end of the night, all the tips were collected and divided by the number of singers, dancers, musicians, and two parts for the owner, And then the tips were divided amongst them. And at that point, there was a lot of discretionary money around in America. There were reasons for that drying up, which I'll get into a little later. But there was a lot of money that people had to spend on fun and leisure in proportion to the economy. However, being a citizen of this country and a pretty much native New Yorker, even though I wasn't born in New York. (laughs) I'm such a New Yorker, I not only don't have a car, I don't know how to drive. Um, But I did not like the idea of low base salary and worrying about would there be enough tips. So I negotiated for a pretty decent firm salary without having to depend on the tips. My share of the tips would go to the owner. And Mariantha said to me, she was surprised that nobody came up with that idea before. And I said, well, I would imagine somebody has, you just haven't heard it. But at that point, I was the only one getting a decent regular salary. And in proportion to the economy back then, it was a pretty darn good salary. Subway fare was a dime. It's $2.75 now. And I started out as an ignorant beginner $25 a night for six night a week gig. That was $150 cash a week. That was, at that point, a lot of money. You could pay for your own apartment, your food, your clothing, and a whole bunch of trouble to get into on that kind of money. My second job, I was getting $30 a night, then $35, then $40, then $45. And if you did private parties like weddings and... um, Greek Glendies or Arabic Haflas, you would get paid four five hundred dollars a show plus the tips. And again they threw them and if you were a dancer at one of these events, you would split the tips fifty fifty with the band. You got to take fifty percent home. And I remember dancing for a church, a Greek church social and uh, where they flew me out to Asheville, North Carolina with the whole band and a couple of singers and a couple of Greek folk dancers. They paid for the band, the dancers, the the whole overnight in the hotel. They paid us very well. And I walked home with 2,000 tips from that night. The priest from the church liked my dancing so much that he came and put 10 $100 bills around my feet on the stage. That was the kind of money. And again, subway fare was 10 cents. A can of tuna was 16 cents. A cup of yogurt was 12 cents, 1960, early 61. 
unfortunately, things have really changed. And as I said at the failing, there were a few dancers from, quote, unquote, over there. Um, but it was mainly the singers who were imported. I worked with people I later found out were humongous stars in Greece and Turkey. And one of my favorites was Mine Drushkin, who was a fabulous, fabulous singer. She and her sister were big stars in Istanbul. And then the sister married an American army sergeant, and she stopped singing. And Mine was offered a contract at the Egyptian gardens to come over and sing. And what she didn't see in the contract was she was also supposed to dance. And the first night she's there singing, the boss comes over and says, okay, go put on uniform, make dance. What do you mean, make dance? Is you also dance? Is it no, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Okay, you go back to Istanbul. Yes, I do. And she actually was one of the best dancers on 8th Avenue for many, many years. And such a beautiful voice and such a charming singer, she could charm the birds down out of the trees. There were some wonderful, wonderful characters working there. And the dancers were mainly of... Greek, Turkish, Lebanese descent. There was one Iraqi and one Algerian who actually worked more in Detroit because there was a large Arabic-speaking community in Detroit that had clubs there. Uh, There was one Iraqi who was in a category all her own. She was amazing. Her name was Samia. I wonder where she is. Anywho, in watching the different dancers from the different places and the ones who were there... Each dancer had her own approach. They were using basically the same movements, but they were using them in a different way, each one from the other. And it's the same thing now. It's like when someone says, do you do Egyptian style? And I say, what do you mean by Egyptian style? Samia Gamal, who didn't dance like Tahir Karaoke, who didn't dance like Holda Shem Saldin, who didn't dance like Zen Ratali, and none of them danced like Nebuwe and Mustafa. They were all Egyptian, or so Herzaki didn't dance like Negwa Fawad. Negwa Fawad certainly did a different show than Fifi Abdu. Um, I could name like dancer after dancer after dancer who were all Egyptian and all unique, one from the other, but they were using the same movement vocabulary. It's like we all speak English, but we'll all express a thought in our own way, using basically the same vocabulary, but with our own way of expressing it. It was the same thing. But there were, at that point in New York, and actually in most of the other places I ended up working in the vicinity, there were no Egyptians dancing in New York at the time. Um, I had a great time there. I loved it. And another thing there was if you were working regularly in one of the clubs and something happened, if you were ill or you had an accident or you got robbed or whatever, if there was a tragedy and you needed help, you needed money, these people would take the shirts off their backs and give it to you and help you out. They could sometimes be a little crazy and they were always drama queens. Everybody was a drama queen. I learned early on that if you speak quietly and state your case with logic and reasoning, you're not going to get anywhere. You've got to raise hell, carry on like Sarah Hartburn on a bad day, take your costumes from the dressing room and run out into the street and nail a taxi. Then they listen to you. Then they'll give you a raise. Then they'll stop trying to get you to do a third dance on a night when you're only supposed to dance twice. So I learned that in this culture it's okay to be a drama queen. And boy, could I work that. And what, hap- what I liked there at the time that I'm going to contrast with what's happening nowadays is that these were people who came to these restaurants because they loved their music. They loved their dances. It was a major part of who they were and what they were to themselves in their own hearts and souls. And they were really happy and proud about it to do it for fun and to do it as recreation and with the members of their family or people they knew well. But you don't want your daughter to become a professional dancer because that's not good for her reputation if she's going to get married. So if a girl was a dancer in that day and age and was from one of the cultures, once she got married, she was supposed to stop dancing, 
which is peripherally, in a way, how I ended up getting my name. There was a dancer working in Boston who was Algerian. She was gorgeous and a wonderful singer, and she used the stage name Morocco. She was getting married and was going to stop dancing. Mariantha was a friend of that Morocco's. Mariantha said, I look Moroccan, and this is when I started going to Morocco, I found out she was right. I sure do look Moroccan or Algerian or Tunisian or Egyptian or whatever doesn't have to be a blue-eyed blonde. But she asked that Morocco permission to give me the name because she thought I looked so Moroccan. So that Morocco came to New York to look at this going to be Morocco to see if it was okay to use the name, and she gave it her full okay, which is how come I got the name. Because when they first suggested I use the name Morocco, all I could think of was, blah, like Webster's Dictionary on Morocco Bound. I want a name that's more exotic, like Sheba or Cleopatra. And they said, no, you don't, because every other American is calling themselves Sheba or Cleopatra or Princess this or Princess that. And it was a choice of using Carolina or Morocco. And Carolina was, A, my birth name, and B, the name I used in flamenco. So I figured, okay, I'm Morocco. Well, guess what? 58 years later, <clears throat> somebody calls me Carolina. I know they don't know me or they <laughs> they have something to do with legalities or checking passports or trying to send me a subpoena or something like that. If somebody calls and asks for Carolina, I know they don't know me. Next topic here. The first big change. There were more and more jobs because in that day and age, in the early 60s, we were considered hot stuff. This was at a point where it was still illegal to do any kind of stripping in New York City. If you wanted to see strippers, you had to go to Union City, New Jersey, to the Ziegfeld Theater or the Union Theater there, to see strippers who could only go down to uh, pasties and a G-string because it was against the law in New York. And actually, earlier in the century, it was against the law in New York to do quote-unquote belly dancing or oriental dancing. But that was no longer illegal. It was illegal to do any kind of shipping. So those places that wanted to have something that they thought was a little titillating or a little exotic would hire a quote-unquote belly dancer And it didn't matter if she could dance or not, as long as she had a costume. We had a whole bunch of dancers that we called the wonderful walkers who couldn't dance worth diddly. They wouldn't know Bellity from Beefsteak. But they could go out and strut around in their costume with attitude and catitude and keep an audience mesmerized for half an hour, 40 minutes, doing pretty much nothing but walking and strutting. They didn't do very well in the ethnic clubs. We had a few of them that didn't last very long, but in the American clubs, they did great. Ah, You know, I've heard other dancers refer to them as the showgirls. Some of them did, but we didn't didn't use that um, on 8th Avenue that I heard. I called them the wonderful walkers because somebody had said, what they do, all they do is walk. And I said, yeah, but they walk wonderfully. And they would mainly swish their veils and twirl their veils because veil work was pretty much American. A lot of the Turkish girls that worked in the American venues then took that back. If they went back to Turkey and they danced there again or if they passed it on. But there was a veil work section of the dance because most of the dancers didn't have enough of a repertoire of movements to be able to do 30 to 45 minutes because they didn't know Oriental dance to begin with. The fact was, though, that they they did some beautiful veil work, and I've seen veil work, especially like some double veil work, that's so beautiful it made me cry. And But that is pretty much an American invention, and it was used to stretch the stage time and to give some variety and some emotion. And with a good with a good performer, it worked. It worked beautifully. And there were all these jobs. And the cat skills, which was a big deal in the 60s through the 70s in the mountains in upstate New York, where every hotel would have shows on Friday and Saturday and Sunday nights, and they would hire performers to come in. They wanted, quote-unquote, 
strips and bellies. And so a couple of the club date agents got together and decided to try a school. And the first official school in New York City was when a club date agent named Joe Williams took Serena, may she rest in peace, and opened a school called Stairway to Stardom, where she and a couple of other uh, exotic dancers were teaching classes to supply dancers because there were so many jobs and so few performers. If, As I said, if you had a costume and you were Godzilla, you'd have six night a week work, seven night a week work, because of the fantasy and the mystique about the the dance and what most Americans thought it was. So there was this school, and there had been a school earlier in California, a year or two earlier. Bert Balladine and a dancer named Sula opened a school in California. Um, and uh, he has some really great stories to tell about that, but that's a whole other book. But that was one of the first big changes where there were classes producing what most of us called the 10-week wonders because a lot of these venues, it really didn't matter if you could dance or not as long as you looked good in the costume, which made it kind of frustrating if you really wanted to do you know, learn what you were doing and do it well. I wanted to because I could see the difference in quality and the different the people who came to the restaurant and how they dance and the dancers that I saw performing, there were some who were just marvelous and there were some who looked like they would rather be home doing the laundry, which I think is kind of not fair to the audience or to themselves. But that was the first big change where all of a sudden there were whole bunches of dancers or people who could sell themselves as dancers competing for the work. And because it didn't take them that long to learn the little bit they knew, they sold themselves more cheaply for the jobs. The agents made a lot of money. The club date agents would charge five, six hundred dollars for a show and pay the dancer forty or fifty dollars. And when I confronted one of the agents because I found out what he was doing, he said I didn't tell you what I was getting paid. I didn't tell her what I was getting paid. I asked her, is she willing to do the job for $45? She said yes. So she got her $45. I charged them $750 because that's what I charged them. If she asked for more, I might have given her more. If she asked for it up front or if I couldn't get anyone who would go for $45, which was a very important lesson for me. The second big change, which was an even bigger change, in 1972, the Shah of Iran needed money to buy war toys from American weapons manufacturers, and he wasn't making too much money with what the oil prices were. So Nixon, Kissinger, and the Shah got together, and there was the first big oil embargo, which was supposedly triggered by Nixon sending a second or third rate government official to a big shindig in Saudi Arabia that really ticked off the House of Saud. They felt very insulted. And there was an oil embargo declared where people were shooting at each other in the lines to get gasoline for their cars while there were whole barges filled with gasoline in the Hudson River waiting for the price to go up. Gasoline went from 25 cents a gallon to a dollar fifty, two dollars a gallon in less than two weeks. In 1972. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The oil embargo started in 72, and by 73, this was what was happening. And if people didn't have enough gasoline to get to their jobs, they weren't going to a restaurant on the weekend to watch a dancer because a lot of the venues that those of us who did what we thought was the real thing in that era, worked in on weekends were the mom-and-pop Lebanese and Syrian and Greek restaurants, that when Turkish restaurants, too, that would have shows and catering to American audiences for the weekend. And a lot of Americans weren't going to go because they blamed the Middle Easterners for the rise in gas prices that also repercussed on every other price. If gasoline went from 
25 cents a gallon to a dollar fifty a dollar seventy five a gallon your heating oil went up too your gas for fuel went up and everything that was peripheral to that the price of plastic went up because it's made from petrochemicals the whole economy in a way went down the hopper and that's where all that wonderful discretionary money that was able to be thrown as tips or handed out around your feet as tips pretty much dried up at that point and a lot of the jobs dried up and also these little like 10 week wonder make your husband a sultan in 10 lessons dance schools that opened up around the, the city and then around the country because they were seeing the example of new york from stairway to stardom and the schools in california they were producing all these people who not only thought they were dancers some of them were uh they wanted the jobs so they were working cheaper and cheaper and it got to the point where subway fare was no longer 10 cents i don't remember what it was in 73 i'd have to look it up but um they were willing to work for less and less money and it got to the point where in some venues in smaller towns where they had like little greek where um uh gyro places and lebanese shawarma places were doing lunch shows just for tips and in some instances splitting their tips with the boss so in effect they were paying to dance there and that was another big change which kind of weakened what dancers were getting paid however something else happened in 1972-73 that was pretty wonderful there was a man named Paul Monty who was a dance and art teacher for children who had the cliche attitude about quote unquote belly dance until he saw a show with a good dancer and it was actually a show by Serena May she rest in peace. He saw her by accident in the venue where he was. He was in a restaurant and she was doing a show, and he liked what he saw. She was a very classy dancer. She was a good dancer, and he liked it and realized that he had had the wrong idea about this dance form. And when he told some of his fellow dance teachers, because these were people who specialized in teaching dance to children. You know, where you get tap toe ballet and acrobatics in an hour for a dollar, a dollar fifty. Um, they wouldn't believe him, so he said, okay. He was going to bake, produce seminars and present teachers in this dance form. And he started backing and putting, uh, putting on seminars in 1973. And he's the one who made me and Ibrahim Farah and Serena and all the names from that era into seminar teachers by giving us the chance to do it. And the people that came at first, there were people who would travel four days on a bus to get to a seminar. There was one woman who, God bless her, she advertised her dance as the dance that drove the lust crazed sultans mad. Tra-la. She went in full costume to the airport in this town in Florida, got on the plane, took the plane to where the seminar was in full costume the whole time, gets off the plane, goes to the hotel where the seminar is being held, registers, spends that whole weekend in costume. And it, the, it, the people who came ran the gamut from those who'd never had a class before and thought they were going to learn everything in one seminar to those who were really serious about it. However... They were more interested in costumes, in fancy steps, in what I called flash and trash, than in learning what kind of culture it came from, because that was the one of the things that really interested me when I was with the people that, whose cultures it came from, when I was learning in their kitchens and their living rooms. They would tell me what the things were about and why this was this way and that was that way and how when the song is sad, you don't go around grinning like an idiot. And when the song is happy, you don't go around looking like you're having an intestinal virus attack, trying to be dramatic. Um, But the people who came to the seminars, the early seminars, 
uh, were there out of curiosity, out of fulfilling their fantasies, and there were some who really wanted to know. And some fine dancers came out of Paul Monty's putting his money where his mouth was and starting this. And, of course, when you find a good idea, all of a sudden everyone else gets on the bandwagon and starts imitating. And so there were a lot of people that started producing seminars, some of them foolishly programming a seminar two weeks before one where Paul was bringing people in instead of saying, well, when are you doing this? I can do another one three months later or three months earlier. There was It was more like competition and chewing your ankles off than trying to get some kind of cooperation going. However, there were those people who would cooperate and who were a delight and a pleasure to deal with. Paul Monty actually took NYU to court to be able to do a master's degree in Middle Eastern dance and a PhD. And when he died much too soon from AIDS, he was Dr. Paul Monty, and I was his consulting expert. I couldn't do a PhD myself at that point in the field because they said it was self-serving since I was already a dancer. But because he was a double-mastered academic, a non-professional dancer, and a male, it was okay for him to do the paper, which was the way things were back then. This was the mid-'80s already. And it actually kept him alive probably three, four more years longer than he would have been because he was going to finish that doctorate (laughs) no matter what, and he did. May he rest in peace. He was a sweet, sweet, wonderful man. Now, I was teaching seminars all over the country and in Canada and a couple of other places by now, Um, but mostly on the North American continent. And when I would teach in California, and people would ask, well, do I do tribal or do I do cabaret? It's like, excuse me, there's no such thing as cabaret. Over there, a cabaret is a polite term for a whorehouse. And what they're calling tribal is really interesting theater. It's very fun and fascinating theater, but I ain't never seen a tribe that over there that dances like that or dresses like that or has the elaborate tattoos like that. It's good theater, but if it's tribal, it's California tribal because it sure ain't Moroccan. It's not Berber Amazai. It's not Bedouin. It's none of the above. And when I was trying to explain this to people at the seminars, they didn't believe me. So I took films. I got myself a Super 8 sound camera, and I filmed everything I could get my little face in front of and get away with. There was a lot of places you couldn't film because once the camera came out, it changed the whole dynamic. People all of a sudden became very artificial and stiff when they had been dancing their little tails off before. And when I brought the films back, some people said, well, you could hire people to do that. We don't believe you. I was like, okay, tell you what, I'll take you with me. I'll put together dance tours, and if you are so interested in seeing the real stuff, come with me and I'll show it to you. So in 1975 or 76, I have to look up what year, I think it was 70, yeah, I took a group to Morocco to see the Marrakesh Folk Festival, and that was a hoot and a half because King Hassan II was the king of Morocco at the time, and he was a real king king, it was his country. He decided he didn't feel like having the folk festival the week it was supposed to be. He was going to start it a week later. And my group was going to be leaving the day that that festival was supposed to start, the uh, rescheduled festival. So Henny Penny here goes marching down the main street in Marrakesh. She's going to go up to see the king and ask to have the festival that night because my whole group had come, and I had like 60-some-odd people, had come to see the folk festival, and they were going to see the folk festival. It was in a marching up to the door of the palace. A car stops, and somebody I knew from the Moroccan pavilion at the World's Fair, Rashid Ali Drisi, gets out and says, Rocky, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here to see the king. What do you mean you're here to see the king? I'm here to see the king. Why are you here to see the king? So I told him why I was there to see the king. And he said, oh, you have a point. I'll talk to my cousin about it. So what's your cousin going to do? It's the king. He's my cousin. I said, but wait a minute. I know you how many years? 
This is the first I'm hearing this, because I had met Rashid in the Moroccan Pavilion at the World's Fair in 1964, and we had been friends six since then. And he said, well, when did it ever come up in conversation? We had a private performance of the entire folk festival in the afternoon on the palace grounds, and in the evening we had a full evening of Shichat and Gidra, where I was able to record the music that I used for my dance company, Shichat, and for our Gidras. And that was like, where does that happen in real life? <laughs> <laughs> so Henny Penny got to see the king's cousin. Now, I was the first to bring groups to see, specifically to see dance and to see what it was like, first to Morocco and then to Egypt. But it was Eva Cernik who was the first to take a group to Turkey. And it was at around the same time. And I found out something that was very important for me in putting these groups together and bringing them over. That every person is the product of their own lifetime experiences. What they've learned, what they feel, what they've thought about things. And when they see something for the first time, it's always seen within the lens of what their whole life has led up to there, and they will look at it and see different things in it. And by bringing all these people who had never seen stuff that I had seen over and over again, to see it for the first time and watching how they react and what their questions were and what they wanted to know or what they assumed certain things were, put a whole new perspective on a lot of things for me. It was a fabulous learning experience for me as well because it brought out um, nuances that I hadn't thought, that I hadn't noticed or thought about. And it it was like, this was a fabulous learning experience on all sides. Now, one of the reasons that my groups, Knockwood, did so well was I made sure that they got full cultural orientation about how to dress and how to act while we were in the other countries because you can pretty much say what you want, do what you want, even if you're female in uh, the U.S. of A., but when you get off that plane in downtown Marrakesh or midtown Cairo, it's a whole other ball game, and you have to be very careful about certain things, or you can get into deep trouble or have to pay much higher prices when you bargain in the souks. And so I made sure they had all the information I could give them and all the help I could give them. It fully satisfied whatever perverted maternal instincts I may have had at the time. But there were other tour leaders who thought, well, just because I was doing it, they could make a lot of money. And I never made a lot of money on it. I got my free trip and maybe 50 to 60 bucks a head profit, like big profit. Um, but I got to work 24-7, and I met people I never would have met otherwise. I made friendships that I have to this day because of it. I'm so grateful for that. And I had been, before that, brought groups to the Soviet Union for Russian language tours. And after that, bringing a bunch of dancers to Marrakesh or to Cairo or to Istanbul was a lot more fun, I can guarantee you that. But one of the things that happened with some of the other tours is they were not given cultural advice. They were not given dress guidelines. And so some of them had unpleasant experiences because they innocently were acting like normal, everyday American ladies. And no one had told them that it's a different culture, that Alice had just gone through the looking glass. And then the Lebanese Civil War started. And there had I was at that point planning on bringing a group to Lebanon, but the Civil War kind of put the kibosh on that, so I never did get to bring a group to Lebanon. And uh, the dance scene there hasn't really fully recovered since, but the Lebanese, Syrian, Jordanians who could afford it ended up going for their entertainment to downtown Cairo, which is how come they clubs in Cairo were doing so well through the early 1990s. Um, I could bring a group to Cairo in the years that I was bringing them from like the 77 through 
94 or so, 93, when uh, I could take them for two weeks, and each night they would see a different big Egyptian star. They saw the Reda Troop, the Komiya, the Fir Amasar al-Samr, which was the real, real folklore, the real Hawazi, and I could have stayed longer. We could have seen more shows, but like two weeks was a enough time because they didn't get much more in vacation. Um, and I couldn't guarantee that now. That whole scene has changed totally. In 1988, I started teaching in Europe, first in Sweden and the UK, and then in Germany. And what I noticed was that the, especially in Sweden and Germany, they wanted to know more about the history and the culture. American dancers still weren't that interested in it. They wanted steps. They wanted choreographies. They wanted to know about costume tricks and how to get jobs, of course. Um, but in Germany and Sweden, they wanted to know which city does this come from? When do they do it? Why do they do it? And that was stuff that I was also interested in. And it was kind of frustrating to me early on in the States that people weren't interested in all this great insider information that made it so much more fun to dance. Because when you knew what it was about, you could do a much more real dance, a much more satisfying dance, both for the audience and for yourself. And I was really glad that these people in Europe wanted to know more. And in the UK, it depended on which school it was and how far along they'd gotten, because you always have varying degrees of um, knowledge. Uh, although in Europe, they expected me to know more than the average bear, which was a good thing because I did. Um, and I was glad that they wanted it and that I could rise to the occasion. And then I, Rakia Hassan came over to teach seminars here, and she was doing a tour for Ali Hamidzadeh from Turquoise Hills. Um, and he took her to see Rakasa, because she'd never seen anything like that on the one on the West Coast. She was fascinated and decided she was going to do something like that in Egypt. And it took her 10 years to get it off the ground because of all the bureaucracy and all the things she had to put together. But she did. And she put together the first Ahlan Lasahlan, which was, she didn't call it Ahlan Lasahlan. It was out in the sticks in the Red Sea somewhere. And that one was a bust because she hired the wrong tour agency to do it for her. She thought that they would be able to do it. And this guy, I think his name was Magdi Sayed. I don't know, I have a couple of letters from him somewhere on my computer. But he didn't know what he was doing because he wanted me to come and teach. And I asked him, well, what are the rooms going to be like? Are there mirrors? Are there, is there a music player? What, are you, what do you have? What's this? He said, oh, we figure that out when you get here. I said, no, we don't because I ain't getting there. Um, but then she took it into Cairo with different people. And it became quite the success. Unfortunately, the general situation in the Middle East has had a really severe impact on going to any of the countries at the moment. But as far as the styling of dance and what was going on here, as time went by, especially in the mid to late 80s, other people, thank God, began getting interested in doing research, too, and wanting to know about the finer points and which story was true. Was it this? Was it that? Was it the other? So the reason I started going over there was because in going to the homes, a Turkish granny would tell me one story. An Armenian auntie, of course, had a totally other story. An Egyptian granny had a different story from a Syrian granny. And an Iraqi aunt had a different story from a Kuwaiti aunt um, or, or from a Saudi aunt. Yemenis had a whole other story. Each area had its own story. And I wanted to know which was the right one who was telling me the truth. And, of course, you go to Morocco, 
the, the country, not me, there were over 200 different Amazai or Berber nations, and there were even there were more of them in Algeria and more in Tunisia, and one was different from the other. A lot of them had their own different languages, and in fact, the Arabic spoken in the Maghreb, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, is called Darija. It's so different from Egyptian Arabic that and Lebanese Arabic that an Egyptian or a Lebanese can't understand the Moroccan, whereas the Moroccans can understand the Egyptians and Lebanese because of all the movies and the Arabic used in the movies. And in the States, people were getting more into learning more because we began to have videotapes. The first portable video camera was JVC, 1978, the camera weighed 45 pounds. You had to carry a full VCR. There was a belt of batteries that weighed 39 pounds and a light with a big VHS tape. That was the first portable video cam available in the U.S. But we began getting tapes from over there, and a lot of people not realizing that most of these tapes that they were getting were not dancers seeking to do a good dance, but were considered soft porn over there. And so some of the tapes that came in in the early days were pretty putrid, but always interesting. I have some of them. And uh, at some point I might find a way to digitize them and have people see them because they were a riot and a half. But we began doing videotapes because we love technology. And if it's there and we can do something with it, we're going to do it. In fact, I am so jealous of the kids who are growing up today that have such facility with computers. I'm still afraid that if I hit the wrong key, I'm going to get the blue screen of death, even though I'm on a Mac and I'm not even on a PC anymore. I'm fascinated with the technology. But we began getting videotapes, and people began asking, well, what's this, what's that? And I would have to say, well, that's a Turkish whorehouse. That is a real dancer. This was somebody's wedding, and this was an Iraqi whorehouse. And this was somebody's probably at a home party with their friends doing something that they didn't expect would get out. But then they began commercializing VHS tapes, quote unquote, over there. And you could go to Cairo and get tapes. And of course, you could get like audio cassettes and then CDs. So more information began coming into the States that was available to us to see and to learn from and try to integrate into our dances if we were so inclined. Because I was going over there so often, I didn't have to wait for the tapes. I was seeing the live shows and in some instances performing myself and or dancing with the dancers myself. So I was, again, assimilating and learning on site. But videotapes had an impact because they brought us information that would have been much more expensive to get if we had to go over there and get it in the way I did it. Also, portable cassette players. When I first started in the business, there was no portable music. The only quote-unquote portable tape player was a reel-to-reel volunsack that weighed 76 pounds. You weren't about to lug that on a club date. Plus, the musicians' union was much stronger back then, and if you worked in an American venue where the musicians' local 802 had sway, you couldn't bring any kind of recorded music, and you couldn't bring your own musicians. So you had to haul tail around to Fiddler on the Roof, Havana Gila, and Miserloo. And I remember one time I was I came out and they were playing a fast two four because they didn't know how an Aguila Mizzaloo were fiddler on the roof, and I'm dancing to a song I thought was really familiar and it's running through my head. And I'm thinking, holy shit, I'm shaking my ass to jingle bells. And <laughs> the band were drunk as skunks. This was at the at what was it, Bushkill Mountain Lodge in Bushkill Falls, Pennsylvania. Oh, God, I'll never forget that gig. And I thought, my God, what kind of a show am I going to do dancing the Jingle Bells? Well, I finished the show, and the manager of the restaurant comes over and says, Miss, that's the best show we've ever had here. 
the audience really liked it. I really liked it. It would be nice if you could come back here at least two times a month. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm pretty much booked for the rest of the year, but I might be able to fit one day in next summer. Holy Christ. (laughs) All I could think of was I ain't coming out to Jingle Bells again, that's for sure. (laughs) So we now had portable cassette players. We also now had a lot of venues where they unfortunately couldn't afford to hire live musicians of any nationality, but we had cassette players where we could bring music. Then we had CD players where we could bring our own music. Now we have iPods where we could bring our own music. However, it's while it's a lot better than hauling tail to Fiddler on the Roof, Mizzaloo, and Havana Gila, it's not the same as a live band with back and forth between the dancer and the musicians when the musician is being cooperative. And we have our internet age where we have YouTube and we have Vimeo and all kinds of ways of passing around tapes and performances and bits and pieces, both good and bad. And you have people who say that they've learned only from copying videos on YouTube. And I've actually seen a couple of people who turned out to be pretty good dancers learning that way. But mostly it's kind of a figment of their fantasy that they're doing as good as the videos. But I have seen a couple of fine dancers. However, what we have now that I love and find fascinating is we have far more people who are into research into finding out what really happened, what was it really like. There's a whole bunch of books coming out now that I recommend that are well worth seeing because we still hear way too much of the fantasy and the Orientalist in the Edward Said sense, uh, the Orientalist racism and sexism of the misinterpretation of Rakshari because it's simply a different movement vocabulary than most Western dances. One of the problems being that when mainly the French and then the Brits pretty much co-opted the countries in the Near and Middle East, they thought the waltz was the height of erotic indecency. So if they saw somebody moving their body, that was considered beyond indecent, and they brought that attitude and that racism and that sexism and their Orientalist fantasy of a whole room full of subservient women with them, then, and it colored their idea of what the dance was. And we're still fighting that, and the misnomer is not helping, which is why I make such a soapbox out of it. But <clears throat> I wouldn't care if you called it tail twitching as long as it was given the respect and the appreciation it deserves when it's well done. And I'm I'm still fascinated with it 58 years later, or we wouldn't be having this conversation. And then there were the, oh, Lord, there were the forums. Oh, God. I became Aunt Rocky because of one of the forums on the Internet. Um, I was teaching at uh, Mendocino Dance Camp this particular summer. And believe me, if they got me into the woods and into nature, it had to be damn good musicians because I am a city girl. I don't like nature. You can keep your Lyme disease ticks on Bambi and away from me. But I was in Mendocino for the music and the joy of dancing with fabulous musicians. And somebody there told me they were having this whole big discussion about me on an Internet chat list called MEDDanceAtWorldSTD.com. And I was like, what's that? I had just barely started to do email. I bought a computer in 1984 to put my mailing list on because I thought it would get my flyers out quicker and better it didn't Um, but there I was with my email and I find out they're having this whole discussion about me so she had her boyfriend print out the sheets of discussion and what was going on was somebody had said that I pretty much always tell the truth about what the dances are and what I've learned and where I've seen it and how I know what I know because I've always been upfront about it is I find that you can do a lot more with the truth than you can with the fantasy. 
And so they were all discussing how they, this one had had a seminar with me, this one hadn't, this one had heard this, that one had heard that. And somebody piped up, well, if she's so honest, how come there were all those old pictures on the flyers? She's not that young anymore. That fly, you know, she, this is from 20 years ago. And they flamed that poor woman. They carried on like, how dare she? They must have insulted, you know, like the mother of God or something. And I was upset because they flamed her. She had every right to ask the question. So I had to find out, how do I get on this chat list so I can tell her it's okay? I'll tell you why it's an old photo. And I was afraid because I'd never downloaded anything from a disk before. So I had these CompuServe disks. And I had to get looped out of my gourd to get the courage to download them, which I did. And then I type, how do I get out here? And I get back the answer, you are. Um, and so there I am on the med dance list. And because I was drunk as a skunk, even though I was kind of coherent, it was obvious that I was high. So they started calling me the high commissioner. <laughs> on the uh, because of that one evening, and then they shortened it to commish because of, there was this TV show then about a police commissioner from upstate New York who believed in um, treating felons and suspects uh, with warmth and friendship that they could get more out of them that way. So it was a popular series for a few seasons called Commish. So I began signing my emails, Commish. Because I thought everybody was in on the joke. And then I get this really nasty, nasty 10-page email from a guy in Toronto who was at the university there saying, who the hell did I think I was declaring myself the commissioner, putting myself on this high pedestal as the authority because he didn't know what it was all about. But he had a habit of sending really nasty emails to women who were on this list. And I realized, wait a minute, he has a point there. People don't know me, think I'm calling myself commish. That's not a good thing. i got to find something that's friendly. My tour people used to call me Mama Ducky because they'd all be behind me, following me down the streets of Cairo or Marrakesh when I was pointing out this uh, site or that site or this is where you get good fabric and this is where you don't get good fabric and don't buy those costumes because they're going to fall apart. But here you can get good spices, but don't let them sell you what they're calling Spanish fly and that kind of thing. So they said, there I am like Mama Ducky keeping all my little duckies in line. But I figured, you don't listen to your parents. So if I call myself Mama Ducky, they might think I was being too much of a smothering mother. Who do you listen to, your favorite aunt or your favorite uncle? And that's how Aunt Rocky was born. I began calling myself Aunt Rocky because my nephews called me Aunt Rocky. And it actually did the trick. It really did the trick. It made people see me as not not as an enemy, but as somebody who wants to share. I loved that chat list because the person, one of the things the person who was moderating it was not a dancer herself. So she could be like totally objective and she didn't let anything really nasty get through, although there were some flames. But I got on the list and I explained to the young woman that she had every right to ask that question and that they really shouldn't have gotten so angry at her because I wasn't angry at all. The answer to that question, why are those photos so old, is it cost four or $500 for a decent photo session. And this was in like the... What was it, the early 90s? Yeah, something like that. And for four or $500, I could get a whole, like a couple of peripherals for my computer. Since you don't really need photos to work club dates, why should I spend that money on a new photo? It's, what's important is do I get there? Do I do the seminar? Do you learn something from me? I don't have to be a glamour queen 24-7. I mean, I sure don't wake, wake up looking like I do in those photos. So we not only she not only accepted the answer, we became friends. And I have made such wonderful, wonderful friends because of the internet, because of chat lists, because of sharing. And I am eternally grateful, although I'm not too thrilled with Facebook because during the build-up to the Chief Cheeto 
running to usurp the office of president, um, I was candid about my opinion of him. And a dancer I know was not thrilled with my opinion because she was a fan told Facebook that I was using Aunt Rocky as a way to lure children. What? What? Yeah. They closed down my page and they made me like you. They put my whole legal name on there. I had to fight tooth and nail to get Morocco put on there. Yeah. In their infinite wisdom, they said that it wasn't my legal name. And I said, my book is called You Asked Aunt Rocky. I've got emails going back to 1992 that address me as Aunt Rocky. I have nephews that address me as Aunt Rocky. They still wouldn't back off. So now they have, they have the whole goddamn Morocco Carolina Varga Danica. What about my security? So I'm not too thrilled with Facebook for that, and also because of the fact that they were allowing the you know troll bots to wax prolific and ruin the election. But that's only my opinion. Any questions? Oh, yeah, one more thing. So, okay, okay. Go for it. One more thing, which is really most important. The contrast between the emigrations in the 60s that I learned from and that I partied with and, and, and went home with and felt that these were an extended family and loved them dearly and they loved me. The current immigrations are a whole other thing because in the late 70s, early 80s, pretty much around the time of the assassination of Sadat, with the Saudis on one side and the Iranians on the other side, putting in billions of dollars for the case of a fundamentalist Islam that's equivalent to the Puritans landing at Plymouth Rock. The current immigrations are far more neoconservative than the generation that was there when uh, I was learning. And there, that's one of the other reasons why there aren't as many actual Middle Eastern-owned clubs with dancers and, and shows that there were back then, because these people are not proud of that part of their culture. They've been pretty much the same way the colonials brainwashed in the schools the current madrasas are brainwashing toward being against any kind of public performances by women. And the first people that power-hungry, insane murderers go after are the artists that point out their faults. And that really, really worries me also because most of these places are in the middle of some very serious wars over and over again. Look at poor Syria. And Iraq is a mess. And Afghanistan's back pretty much under the Taliban. So a lot of the places we could go to dance or to learn about the dance are gone. And a lot of the people who did it, the older people who knew what the traditions were, they're gone. And the Internet, while it has wonderful things about it, and YouTube and Vimeo and iPods, we can get all this music and going back and forth. It tends to homogenize the cultures because it's going back and forth so much. We appropriate from each other so that sometimes you can't see where one ends and the other begins. So a lot of the individual things are, I think, very adversely affected by it because the young folks don't understand that you can have it both. You can learn the traditional stuff and you can do the new stuff. No one is preventing you from doing new stuff if you know the old stuff. No one is present, preventing you from learning about the old stuff if you're doing the new stuff. So that does concern me. Now the floor is yours. Sure. sure. So, so I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit of echo on, on your, your line, so I'm going to actually turn off my audio for one second. Um, okay. So I think the big thing that I'm thinking about, you know, thinking about everything you've said and looking back over these almost 60 years. Um, if we think about any facet of this, the business, the community, or the dance itself, I'd love to hear what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen that make you sad? And what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen that you're happy about? What I'm happy about is 
the quality of dance in general has improved so much in the amount of time I've been in this business. I wasn't kidding when I said if Godzilla had a bedla, she would have had a seven night a week gig when I first started because standards were much lower. People didn't know what the things were about or because there weren't that many people up there doing it. The standards and quality were much lower. There's some fabulous, fabulous dancing being done pretty much any place you go. That makes me very happy. What makes me very sad is what's happening in the world today, politically and economically, that is adversely affecting the the perpetuation of these wonderful art forms. That makes me crying sad. Mm -hmm. And if if you could, could, you know, have have dancers dancers carry carry through through. some things that were available to you um, at various parts of this career and make sure that they go forward into the next generation and the generation after that, what would you want them to carry forward? What the dance is about, interpreting the music well, putting yourself into it, understanding what the emotions are that go with it. It's kind of like, you know, passing down like ballet or gymnastics, but more so because with something like gymnastics, most of it is, pure athleticism and technique. And unfortunately, there are people who think if they do a bigger hip drop, they're doing a better hip drop. I used to beat the music to death till I saw a film of one of my dancers and I thought they'd speed it up the film. I was so embarrassed I wouldn't leave the house for a week. But I would, I would, I would like them to be able to know and do the beauty that is Rakshargi. And the the fact that you're taking this movement vocabulary and using it to show the beauty of the music through how you hear the music. It's like speaking a language, except it's physical. And I would like that to, to continue. I'm just worried about whether or not the world will continue <laughs> with Chief Cheeto calling the you know North Korean leader Rocket Man and although there's supposed to be talks happening, it's kind of, you know, because we're in an art field, a lot of us tend to forget that there's a world out there and that we have to be aware of the politics and the economics of the real world. And that's a big bring down. It is, it is, but it's true. true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing is, if you know what's going on, you can get around and you can get, you know, you can get what you need and get out of the way. (laughs) All right. Well, this has been fantastic, but I'd like to open this up to questions and answers from our listeners. So before we do that, um, so folks who are listening, start thinking about questions you might want to ask, or if there are any of your favorite takeaways that you want to share, we would love to hear from you. Uh, But before we do that, Rocky, you know, if people take one thing away from this call, if there's one thing that they remember and hold on to and take to heart, what would you want that to be? That this is a beautiful individual, soulful, loving, social, and folk dance, and that it deserves to survive. And it's something that gives pleasure to not only the viewer, but to the doer. I think it's, I I love it. I still love it. And I'm really, really sad that my severe osteoporosis has prevented me from dancing for like almost three years, I'm just beginning to be able to begin to move again. The good thing about that was because I couldn't move, I wrote two books. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, speaking of your books, books. if people want to learn more from you, how can they do that? They can write to me, Morocco at Mm Cosbadance.org. And where can they get your books? Pardon? And where can they buy your books? Me? Although if they're not in the U.S. of A., they can get them from Amazon.com because outside of the U.S., the postage is much higher to send from here. So people who are in Canada, they can get it at Amazon in Canada, and that will be Canadian postage. And if you're in Europe, um, there's an Amazon in Germany. It's Amazon.de, and there's one in the U.K. where you can get it in English or in German. 
Great. And are you still teaching any workshops or seminars, lectures? I'm going to be teaching, well, the actually the movement syllabus, um, the fundamental movement syllabus. I'm going to be teaching it in Vancouver, B.C. on the, I think, the 6th, 7th, and 8th of April. It'll be the first time I'm teaching the whole syllabus. Great. And if folks would like to bring you to their city, is that something that you're still doing on a regular oh, basis? The who? So if somebody wanted to bring you to their city to teach, is that something that they can get in touch um, with you about? Well, we'd have to, um, they can approach me about it, and we'll see how my health is. This um, this gig in Vancouver is to see if I can still do it. And I think I'll be able to because I'm bringing my friend who was my assistant to do the some of the physical stuff. I did a PowerPoint. I actually had a PowerPoint done of the whole book so that I can show the drawings and explain the whole thing while she physically demonstrates, and I will demonstrate what I can, and what I can't, Karen will do. So she comes with me, and that way I can get, and of course I can talk. My mouth is still working. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and open up to questions from the listeners. So okay. folks, if you're on the phone or Skype, you can press star star to unmute yourself. If you're only listening on the webcast um, and if you don't have your mic connected, you can use the question box on the right. That looks like a little square question bubble with three dots. So if you'd like to ask a question or share your favorite takeaway, we would love to hear from you. Did I put everyone to sleep? <laughs> I think there's always somebody who's shy about being the first one to ask a question. I swear I won't bite a head dinner. <laughs> well, while we're waiting, I'm actually going to share my favorite takeaway. Um, and that was about the oil crisis kind of ruining the nightlife industry. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I know that I some know. of that happened around 2000, uh, around um you know, 9-11, there was definitely uh -huh. a drop in that as well. But yeah. I remember my mom telling me about when she was younger, and especially when her older sister, who was 14 years older than she was, um, you know, when my mom was a little kid, you know, her sister and, you know, her fiance would, you know, get dressed up. She'd put on this uh, practically a ball gown and mm -hmm. they would go out dancing three nights a week. Mm -hmm. And that sounds insane to me right now. But that was that was just a thing that everybody did. They could afford it then. Mm hmm. That was the, actually that was the American dream being realized. And another incident I forgot was when they took the hostages in Iran. And I was actually working at a little Lebanese shawarma place in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, called the, the Beirut. And a bunch of yahoos come in. They were going to lynch the owner because they got our people in hostage in Iran. And I'm sitting there because I had a book with me. I'd just gotten off the bus and I had a book with me. And I said, hey. Bozo. He's not from Iran. It's Iran, by the way, but he's not from there. He's Lebanese. He may be a slime ball, but he's a Lebanese slime ball. He did not take anyone hostage. Here's a map. That's Lebanon. That's Beirut. He's from Beirut. This is Iran. This is Tehran. That is where they have the hostages. If you're so hot to trot, go join the Marines and get them out. And All right. Was that was like during the that hostage crisis. Again, thanks to Nixon and Kissinger. All right, it looks like we've got a caller in Illinois unmuted. Ooh, hi there, hi there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Morocco, this is Johara from Chicago. Hi. Oh, how are you? How are you? It's I'm good to hear your voice. Likewise. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm upright and taking nourishment as well. Um, I have a question for you about what we're seeing in current dance. Uh, oh, if you watch videos uh, with the presence of a lot of dancers um, from Russia in Egypt and a lot of the choreographic um, trends. Oh, the ones that do the gymnastics that, where they're like going to launch their head? Uh, yeah, kind of like that. And... Um, what is what is your sensibility about that? Is that more a trend, or is a, like kind of a? It's, oh, it's the Russian I, I say gymnastics. Trend. You know, it's like a gymnastic. Okay. They turned it into a gymnastic competition because the culture was geared for that. 
the coach was geared for competition. And they, as I, I, I said I used to beat the music to death. I have tapes of me from the 70s that I hope never surface because I was really beating that poor music to death because I figured if I could do a hip movement for every beat that that would be the good thing to do. And then it ended mm-hmm. up looking like a fire drill. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you don't know because the movements are based so totally on the natural muscle structure that they feel much mm-hmm. smaller than they look. So if you're mm-hmm. doing it correctly, you feel like you're hardly moving. If it feels mm-hmm. like you're really moving, you're doing it much too big. And I didn't realize that until we had videotapes and I could see videos of me dancing badly. <laughs> So, okay. yeah, and there are a lot of people well, that, well, that, saying that it's a little too gymnastic, but it's also dangerous to twirl your head like that. You can give yourself a stroke. Well, you can also, uh, you know, end up with a cervical uh, separation in your spine. That's um, what I mean. I, I think the the thing is when they're teaching it, it's the focus seems to be getting the steps and Within one bar of music, they have, like, way too much going on. Um, There's nothing I can do about even... it. <laughs> I wish no, I could. No, I know there isn't. I know. I was I was just asking your, your reaction to it. But oh, that, that is exactly that... my reaction. It's it's horrendous. It's dangerous. And it ain't what the dance is about. It's not right, like trying right. to and lift your head into space. No, and there's no musicality. That's the thing that I'm finding really disconcerting. Yeah. There's yeah, no but... relation to what what's happening in the movement and I'm not going to disagree with you when I agree totally. Yeah. Well, there you go. But no, I, I, you did raise a relevant point. They are geared towards competition. And of course, gymnastics is really a big ticket there. So that, that explains a lot. So. And I'm kind of against competitions in certain areas of the arts. It's like, how can you compare a violet and a rose? You can have the best, most beautiful violet going, but if somebody likes the way roses smell better, they're going to go with the rose. If they like the violet better because they like the color, they're going to go with the violet. It doesn't mean that one is less than the other. Mhm. Mm-hmm. I would say the same thing about certifications. That kind of is depends on who's certifying whether they should be certified insane or not. Well, yeah, it was certification or certifiable. I'm not sure. <laughs> certification yeah. is is the que- the question for me is what body is behind them? I think probably maybe too much academically on these. I things. don't know. I I because I, I really feel like body. okay. And yeah, I don't either. because I haven't been able to get out. Literally. Right. But again, I I find that kind of another it it seems like it's an appropriative uh, monetization tactic in a lot of ways, maybe. I don't know. A lot of people would disagree with me, but... Things like that come and go. The good news is they go. Yeah. Especially when <laughs> you people go. start being injured and not being able to dance because they've separated cervical vertebrae. Uh, good point. Well, thank you, yeah. my dear. It's always wonderful to hear your voice. Thank you. Mm. All right. Back. Thanks, I'm Johara. So breathing. If anybody else would like a quest- to ask a question or share your favorite takeaway or just chime in, you can press star star to unmute yourself, and we would love to hear from you. I really did put everyone to sleep. <laughs> nah. All right, Johara, we've got you unmuted again. Uh, did you have something else you'd like to ask or say? No, I forgot. I forgot to remute myself. My bad. Oh, you know, I muted you, and I think you unmuted yourself again. <laughs> All right. All right, if there's anybody else who would like to chime in, last call. All right, then I think we are going to call it a night. Thank you so much, Rocky. Oh, my pleasure, sweetheart. Anytime. All right. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming. This is the end of our call, but that doesn't mean that the conversation has to end. We've got a private Facebook group just for Clubhouse members. Um, I'll send out a link to that shortly. Um, We'll also include a link to the call recording. So if you want to listen to this again and pick up on any of the details that you might have missed, you can do that as well. And I'll also include a link to Morocco's website. So if you'd like to check out any of her books or anything, you can do that there. 
We've also got a survey link. So if you'd like to give us any feedback for topics, speakers, or improvements, we would love to hear from you. Um, I actually have folks booked for most of this year. So I'm um, not booking for the next couple months, but I'd still love to hear what your ideas are. And our next call has not been scheduled yet, so I'm not going to share the details yet, but keep an eye on your inbox and we'll have those uh, for later in March. Um, it is March 1st, but technically this is a February call because this was the best timing we could get. Um, and the last thing that I want to say is that this is the come on in kind of clubhouse, not the no boys allowed kind. So if you know somebody who you think would enjoy these, you can invite them to join us at bellydancegeek.com slash clubhouse. And until next time, happy dancing. Good night, everybody. Good night, sweetheart. Thanks for listening. For more geektacular resources, visit bellydancegeek.com.